Medieval Japan was in constant turmoil. Wealthy land barons waged bloody wars upon each other to gain more and more territory. As the time went on, these groups, through practical experience, became well-trained and equipped armies, which waged large-scale battles with thousands of troops on each side. It wasn't until the late 16th century that Japan was finally united under one ruler, Toyotomi Hideyoshi. Hideyoshi had risen through the ranks from foot soldier to general by the age of 27, and ruler of Japan by the age of 59. Under his brief but potent rule, he disarmed the populace, established a rigid class system, and a strong ethical standard for samurai. He also admonished samurai not to neglect their martial skills, amongst which was Hojo Jitsu, the art of tying the enemy with ropes or cords after first subduing him with jujitsu or the weapon arts. Trussing up an important enemy and transporting him back to the rear for interrogation or for ransom could well change the outcome of the battle. A 
Upon the death of Hideyoshi in 1598, Tokugawa Eisu became guardian to Hideyoshi's five-year-old son and heir. The boy was disposed of, and Tokugawa was appointed shogun by the emperor in 1603. Tokugawa established his capital in Edo, present-day Tokyo, on the main island of Honshu. He lived in splendor, supported by a very impressive samurai army. As shogun, he controlled the armies, levied and collected taxes, and policed the nation. Directly under his command was the Ometsuki, or all-seeing eye. This high-ranking samurai appointed all local magistrates as well as hiring and deploying the shinobaka known today as ninja. Under him was a network of lesser agents or spies known as metsuke. In Kyoto, 500 kilometers in a 16-day march to the southeast was the imperial court and homes of the 300 court noble families. They also lived in luxury but had no real power. Although at first glance this mansion looks like a fortress, it's not designed or equipped to function as such. The court nobles spent their time inventing elaborate ceremonies, writing poetry, painting, or other sedentary pursuits, leaving the actual running of the country to the shogun. This dual or split capital system worked out quite well. While the samurai perfected their martial skills and the shogun was setting up an orderly system of government, the Kuge or court nobles in the south were perfecting the more aesthetic arts. This is the age of isolation, during which time the character of Japan was formed. Each district of any size had a resident magistrate. He was usually a very high-ranking samurai and was a chief law enforcement officer. He wore a specific type of helmet when on duty as well as his long and short swords. He carried a jute or a resting trenchion with him with a handle wrapped in purple cord and displayed it as a sign of his rank and authority, much as a present-day police officer displays their badge and identification card. He sometimes carried a hojo jitsu cord in his sleeve or kimono, and sometimes an iron rib fan as well, a very effective and deceiving weapon. The magistrate had a retinue of samurai guards and police, sometimes several hundred. They carried two swords as the ranks demanded, and also were equipped with a jute. But this cord was red, showing that they were of lower rank. If they were dispatched to arrest an armed samurai or other dangerous person, he usually tied his sleeves back with a cord called the tasuke to keep them from hindering his sword play. Their hojo jitsu ropes were carried inside their kimono or in their sleeves. He might also wear a plain headband called a hachimaki, or one with a metal protector known as a hachigani. Normally he wore his kimono without a tasuke, but if trouble arose, he slipped off the top kimono to reveal an under kimono that was kept tied back for just such an emergency. routine police work was carried out by commoners under the supervision of the samurai. They can be distinguished by their hairstyle which was mandatory for the commoners. They carried no swords and wore trousers and leggings under the kimono which was tucked in the back. The rope was carried on his side by tucking it under the obi or the sash. And he carried a red-handled jute in place of a short sword. He might hide both the rope and the jute inside his kimono if working undercover. These are authentic medieval police weapons of various designs. First is a solid iron bar in the shape of a closed fan. It was used as a training device to build up the wrists as well as the weapon. Next is a form of jute, sometimes called a kabotawari, or helmet breaker. But the name should not be taken literally. It is used symbolically to imply that in the skilled hands it could defeat a warrior. Next, an ordinary jute. It is not well designed for actual use. The hook is rather small, and the handle, 
more decorative than functional. Last is an authentic tessin or iron fan. They were carried by many samurai as weapons. This one has steel outside ribs with the bamboo ribs inside. The body of the fan is paper. This kusari or weighted chain is another weapon in the medieval police arsenal. It could be used as is or was sometimes attached to a pole or rope. It was used to trip and tangle, strangle or strike various parts of the body. Non-samurai police could not arrest a samurai, nor could they carry swords. So the kusari and weapons such as this Saudi garami or sleeve entangler with 9, 12 or 16 foot poles were used. When authorized by samurai police to arrest armed suspects, the tip was thrust into the armpits or sleeve of the suspect's kimono and rotated to immobilize the arms, or it could be used to snag the hem of the kimono or hakama to pull him to the ground, so he could be subdued with hojo jitsu. Any attempt to grasp the pole by the suspect was discouraged by the spikes on the shaft. This 19th century woodblock print depicts a large contingent of samurai and commoner police trying to capture an armed suspect who has climbed to the roof of a building. A variety of pole weapons, hooks and tools can be seen as well as many men carrying jute of various designs. Although the costumes are a bit theatrical, the weapons, tools, and tactics are quite realistic. This scene of the magistrate's men trying to capture a Robin Hood type character named Chuchi is a favorite theme for artists and kabuki playwrights. You can also see that the officer's sleeves tie back with a taske, and they are wearing hachimaki or headbands. The suspect has removed his upper kimono for more mobility to foil the attempts to capture his sleeves with a sode garami. He has also previously tied his upper kimono with the taske. When Japan opened her doors to the West, she abolished the class system. Samurai out of style and work clamored for jobs as police officers and other positions of authority in the new government. Commoner police, the most proficient developers and practitioners of Hojo Jitsu, were forced out of their jobs by former samurai, and the art of Hojo Jitsu was almost lost. This early 20th century print depicts Chinese prisoners tied up with Hojo Jitsu during the Sino Japanese War. Note the European type uniforms. Now many former Hojo Jitsu Kai use their skills to make straw sandals, decorative knots for Buddhist temples, and ship rigging. Tying cords is a way of life in old Japan. There were no buttons, zippers, or belt buckles. Everything they wore was tied on. These cords and sashes are required to put on the kimono. Each cord and kimono is handmade, and a good kimono costs several thousands of dollars. Sword bags had their own special knot. And the sogeo, the cord on the scabbard, has several different traditional knots. Twenty-three separate pieces of armor and equipment are required to dress a samurai, all of which are tied on or laced together with a cord. The helmet cord alone is 12 feet long and they also carried extra bowstrings as well as their ho jiu-jitsu cords to subdue the enemy. Ho jiu-jitsu is being used here to capture a demon who has been terrorizing a village. Here, the famous artist, Yoshitoshi, uses an authentic ho jitsu technique in this 19th century print.
rods and ropes used for Ho Jiu Jitsu came in many sizes and colors. Many times certain schools used a particular color. The best cords were about 60% silk for strength and 40% cotton for flexibility. Some had steel weights, hooks, or rings attached. Others for complicated ties requiring long ropes were bundled on each end with a straight piece between. The tie was started in the center. To prepare small thin ropes for carrying, first slip the loop eye over your thumb and spread out your fingers. The cord is then wrapped in a zigzag fashion over the first and little fingers until about four feet of cord remain. The cord is carefully removed from the hand and the remaining cord wound around it making sure that the bundle is not twisted. About eight inches of cord is left, a finger is placed along the bundle and the cord wrapped around at once. The finger is removed leaving a loop through which a bend in the cord is passed and the loop tightened. Tying the subject, the cord was played out as needed. Let's take a closer look at the ring. Notice that the hand can be closed comfortably with the spikes inside or out. If carried loosely in the hand, weighted end can be thrown into a subject's face or thrown to ensnare him. To make the standard knot for the loop, bend the cord about a foot from the end. Make a simple overhand knot near the short segment end and pull it tight. A second overhand knot is then tied between it and the end. Both loops are then tightened. The access short cord is then cut off to about one half inch in length. The cord is then inverted through the loop to form your snare. To prepare the standard size bundle for carrying, Simply hold the line horizontally between your hands and work it back and forth, gathering the rope with the little fingers of each hand until you have about six feet of rope left over. Wind the remaining rope around the bundle, making sure that you periodically check to see that it's not twisted. 
You get more than halfway, turn the bundle around so you can get up to the other end without losing control of it. You have about a foot left over, put your finger along the bundle, wrap the cord around it once, this forms a loop, take your finger out, make a bend in the line and push it up to the loop as you did with the small orange rope. The loop is then tightened. The rope is now ready for carrying. You may put it inside the kimono in the waistband area. Or, if you think there's going to be an immediate need for it, you can take the bundle and place it inside the sleeve of the kimono. Make your loop a little larger, slip it over your own forearm, up toward the elbow, tighten it gently, place the rest of the cord inside the sleeve, and it's invisible. If you then had to capture a suspect, you could grasp his wrist, and without having to let go, just bring the rope down your own forearm, over his wrist, tighten it, and you have the suspect in custody. When carrying the long double bundles, simply take the cord between the two bundles, divide it in half, and tuck it up under the obi or sash at your side. Often the samurai would carry a cord inside his kimono for use as a taske or a sleeve tie. In case of trouble, he would tie his sleeves back with it so that he could use his swords without the sleeves getting in his way. If he happened to have taken a person down and has to hold him under control with one arm, he could then use the taske to tie. Simply untie the taske at the shoulder, place your thumb in the other loop and push straight down, removing the cord from your shoulder. Then you can perform a one-handed slip knot, put it over the opponent's arm, neck, or whatever, and slide it tight. Observe closely to see how the one-handed slip knot is made. This is the method of making a handcuff by just making two loops in the cords, passing one through the other. A second type of handcuff is made by winding the cord around your hand twice, and then once again under the third finger. Hold the loop on the right with your fingers, take the center loop and pass it to the left over the other. Twist your hands and pull them apart, and you have another cuff. This time we're going to make a cuff by undoing the standard loop, making a bend in the center of the loop, and passing it through. We have another standard cuff. This time we're going to make three loops by bringing the cord down to the bottom of the basic loop, making a bend in the line, and pushing the bend through the main loop. You can place one loop around the neck, the other around the wrists, or one around the torso and the wrists, or the feet and the wrists. Next we make four loops. 
separating the space between the two overhand knots, make a bend in the cord, pass it through the lower of the two sections. Pull it through until you have a pair of cuffs. Put them together, let them drop, make another bend in the line, pass it through the main loop, and you now have four sections through which you may put wrists and ankles, wrists and a head and hands, or any combination you desire for the tie you're doing. As an example, we'll tie the feet and the hands together. The bottom loops go over the ankles. Wrists go through the other loops. And you tighten the loops sequentially. Then pass the cord under the ankles, making a bend in the line, passing it back. Now tying the ankles together with a double overhand knot. We're tying this knot on the top so that you may see how we're doing it, but usually you'd put the knot on the bottom so the subject could not reach the knot with his fingers and untie it. He could be then tethered to a pole hang from a beam, or whatever the samurai wanted to do to him. This is the standard way of tying with a cuff. Wrists are through the loops. Now you bring the lines up, over, and down to make sure the wrists aren't pulled apart. You then twist the cords on the bottom and bring one up through between the forearms. Pull them tight, make double bends in the lines, and tie them together on the top with a double overhand knot. Again, we would usually tie these beneath the wrists so that he could not reach them with his mouth. The remaining cord can be braided to make the line shorter. Now sometimes in the old days they used to take fugu or the poison from the blowfish and put them on the knot so that if a man tried to undo them with his teeth he would poison himself. By braiding the knot, you also make the rope stronger in case you were using a very thin line. In this case, we are undoing the loop, straightening the cord out, testing to make sure that the knots are tight, and now we're going to show you how to put someone tight to a pole or a tree. Just redo your loop. You'll make a bend in the line, pass the bend back through the loop, and you'll have a pair of cuffs. Many times they would notch or make a groove in the tree or the pole so that the rope around it wouldn't slide up or down. Once you have the cuffs, just have your suspect put his hands through the loops, tighten each wrist sequentially, pull the main knot tight so all three loops are now tight. Bring the cord up and around, make a bend in the line, and tie your double overhand knot under the wrists. This is a stack tie, which is one of the most important and often used ties in Hojo Jitsu. To simply place the loop around the opponent's wrist, between the wrist bone and the hand and pull down making sure that the loop is pointed down. 
hold the loop with your thumb so it won't move and loosen up. Extend the cord. Twist the cord against itself 90 degrees, then 90 degrees more and slip it over the top of the wrist. Snug it up. Pull down. Bring the line underneath the hand and up the back of the hand. This rotates the scapula down and allows him less movement in the upper arms. Next, we take the other hand, place it on top of the other, which is why we call it a stack tie. Wind the cord again around that wrist between the hand and the wrist bone. Make another half inch by rolling the cord along. Place it over the hand. Pull it tight. Now we make a bend in the line, pass it underneath the wrists, tighten the double overhand knot. After the knot is tied on the wrists, play the line out in the back. Now take the line and feed it through the loop left from the tie. Reach through the loop and pull the strands back in succeeding motions, creating a chain. This will shorten the rope for you. It will also make it stronger in case you're using a thin or weaker rope. It also gives you a lot more control of the suspect because you can then Wind the loose end of the cord around your hand and stick your fingers through the last loop for complete control. We make the chain long as short as we need it. It's there because in case he runs away you can let the chain play out, give you time to pull him back, and you can recover him and tie him. All of these ties should be practiced on a mannequin such as you're seeing now on the screen. Never try these ties on another person. They can be very dangerous. This tie is an extension of the basic stack tie. Just make a bend in the line, pass it under one arm around the front of the body, and back to the back of the body under the opposite arm. Tie the two together, tie it off. This is usually used against people who are not dangerous criminals, but who are tall and thin and might sit out of the tie by bringing their hands down past their buttocks and ankles, thus bringing their hands to the front. They could possibly then be dangerous to you. This is the look of the finished tie. You could also extend another rope onto this one for a lead or a leash. If the subject happens to be injured or very obese and you can't get the arms behind them, you then have to tie the arms in the front. This is what we've done here with a standard stack tie. Now again we're making a bend in the line, passing it under one arm, keeping it to the rear this time and bringing the free end of the line under the opposite arm. We're going to tie these two together in a double overhand knot. And again we finish by making a chain. This is a short rope, so if you wished, you can either keep a short lead on them like this or add an additional cord to make it longer. This is a very simple tie. We just have the basic stack tie in the front, passing the line through the loop from the tie and make an extended chain to the front. You could add several other suspects on the same chain by just making inline cuffs 
and you'd have an actual chain gang. This is the look of the finished tie. This tie is simply a stack tie to the front. Again, we pass it around the back, and this time to the front again, and tie it off. All of these are versions of the same tie. After it's tied off to the loop at the cuffs, again, you can tether them to a pole or make a chain if you wish. And then we start with the front stack tie, and as before, we play the line out and pass it underneath the arms from front to back. Bring it around the back to the front, extend your line, tie it off the cuffs as before. This time, however, instead of stopping here and making a chain, we're going to take the bundle and stick it down between the body and the arms and pass it between his legs and up the back. Pull it tight, make a bend in the line, put it through the line across the back, and tie it off. Here, we make our chain again. In this manner, we control the arms, the torso, and if he tries to run away, a quick pull up on the cord in the back will also injure the groin. You also have control of the center of gravity, which is the easiest way to control the entire body. Next, we do the stack tie in the rear, bring the cord around the front of the body, and tie it off again. Using a bend in the line, passing it through the loop left in the cuff, and tying it off. Taking the bundle now, passing it again between the back and the hands, down the back of the body, through the legs, back to front, up the front of the body, straighten out the line across the chest, hold the vertical line up tight, make a bend in the line, pass it through the horizontal, and again tie it off with an overhand loop. Make your chain in the front. You have essentially the same type of tie as the previous one, but this time you're controlling the man from the front and his hands are in the rear. Again, the finished tie. Starting with the stack tie in the back again, the loop goes down through the legs, back to front again. Snug it up tight. This time, we pass the rope over the shoulder, around the neck, back down the front of the body, through the legs, front to back, snug it up, make a line bend, put it through the loop at the cuffs, Tie it off with a simple overhand loop and tighten it. Again, we'll make our chain. We now control the suspect from the center of gravity in the back and through the neck and groin pressures. This 
Next is a stack tie again in the rear, passing the line up the back, around the neck, and back down again to the loop above the cup. We place the first line that went over his shoulder through the loop. Now you string one loop through the other. There's an inline loop through the other. Snug it up tight, wrap it around the two strings from the neck with an overhand loop and pull it tight. Again, the proverbial chain. We control the suspect by the neck, by both wrists, and the center of gravity. If we tried to run, a small jerk would take him completely off his feet. The next tie again is a stack tie. This time with the stack in the front, down the front of the body, up the back, around the neck from the back to the front, and back again. The line comes down the back, through the legs, back to front, snug it up, make an inline bend through the cuff loop, over the lines with a simple overhand knot, snug it up, and again the control chain. We again have our suspect controlled by the wrists, groin pressure, and the neck. Tuck on the rope from the front and bring the center of gravity up and forward, knocking him off his feet because you've destroyed the base. This is a stack tied to the rear, the rope around the neck and tied off to the cuff again. You just place the suspect on the floor, cross his ankles, run the line down between his ankles, across, down to the other side, make an inline loop, go around the loop from the, the rope from his shoulders, underneath all of them, and tie it up. Bring the line up with an inline loop again, thread it through the cuff link, again make your chain. After taking your suspect down with any number of different forms you might know, hold him on his stomach so they can't move around, and by crossing his wrist and pushing him up, you dislocate or put pressure on the scapula so that he can't move his arms. By putting your simple loop around one wrist, run it to the opposite elbow, around and up through, across the back around the neck, to the opposite elbow, under the elbow and up again, down through the loop and now to the other wrist. Play out your line, hold the line with one thumb as you loop it around his wrist a couple of times. Get some more line, put a hat hitch around it so it won't slip. Make your bend in the line, pass it under both wrists and tie it off with a double overhand knot. To make sure that he isn't going to move, you notice we have a sword near his neck stuck in the ground, so if he moves, all we have to do is push his head toward the sword. By pushing up on his wrists now, you can cause some pain, which will make him bring his leg up or follow any other command you want to give him. Loop the rope around one of the ankles, or both if you wish, a couple, three times. Twist the line, make a little half hitch out of it. 
pull back through the loop, wrap the inline loop around the line and tie it up. Notice we have one leg tied up. The wrists are tied. Both upper arms immobilized and control the neck. Next we're going to make a handcuff loop. As we showed you before, just by making a bend in the line and passing the bend through the natural loop. We tie the hands in back with the cuff, making sure that you tighten the wrist sequentially, that is one wrist at a time, so there's no slippage. Make an inline bend, bring the cord down through the hands, and tie it off. By pressing his elbows together between your bicep and wrist, he can't move his arms. Pass the line around his arms, threading it through, and pulling it tight into a half inch. Go up a little higher and repeat the process. The line goes around both arms, underneath itself, readjust the line across the elbows and pull it to the center. You've got a couple of these in there, you don't have to hold them any longer and continue the process up onto the lower end of the bicep, which will press against the tendons and disallow them to use those muscles. One more. Toward the base of the deltoid or shoulder muscles, we'll pinch the scapula or wing bones together and ensure that he cannot use his arms in any way. Now the rope is passed up and around his neck from back to front. Make sure you keep it taut with one hand while you pass it with the other. Make an inline bend, go underneath the loop, snug it tight, extend your line if you need, go around all of the upper cords with an overhand loop. Snug it up. Now we're going to take the bundle and place it down between the back and the hands. Bring it up through the wrists. Take another inline bend. Extend your cord if necessary. And tie it off by slipping the inline bend loop through the cuff loop. And then tie it off. We could end the tie right here or use several other variations, we're going to extend the tie even further. We're going to bring the bundle down between the legs from back to front and up again. We're going to go underneath the cord that goes around the throat. We can either tie this off at the throat or leave it loose. By leaving it loose like this, if the suspect tries to run away, a yank on the rope will bring his head right down between his legs and will land squarely on his head or flip over onto his back. We now bring the rope up again between the hands, make an inline loop, pass the inline loop through the cuff loop, and tie it off with the usual overhand knot. Again, the usual chain. Now a closer look at the finished tie. The rope around the neck. The hands bundled up. And the control of the wrists. This time we're going to make a spiral cuff. That is, we're going to pass one line through the other and pull it out like we explained in the earlier section. We're going to take these loops and make them very wide, put them together to form one loop, and pass both of the loops 
over the shoulders of the subject. Once over the shoulders, you pass each line under one arm. Bring it up over the loops in the back and to the front again. Under the arm, over the loop in the back, back under the arm, back to front, and back to the rear again. This is done on both sides. When you get to the rear, pull each cord very, very tight. Although this is a very simple looking form, it is one of the most constricting and painful. This technique restricts the diaphragm and the movement of the lungs. Also, it causes pressure and restricts the blood flow from the brachial arteries on the inside of the upper arms. A few minutes in this and your arms go numb. You can finish the tie at this point by making your chain or you may take one hand, put it behind the back, loop the rope around, your usual half pitch, tie it off, bring the other hand back, and do your stack tie, bringing the rope around the wrist again between the wrist bone and the hand. and underneath the knot on the other wrist. Tie it off with an overhand knot. Now take the other line, make an inline bend, pass it underneath both wrists, Tie it off as usual, making sure that you encompass both wrists. With the wrists in the back, it also twists the elbow joint slightly out, so there's even more pain involved than the pain caused by the brachial artery and the lungs being restricted. Going further with the same tie, we then take one of the lines and run it around the neck, back to front, and back down again to the central junction of all the knots. Here, we see the same tie done on these Chinese back in the Sino-Japanese War. Now adding another loop to the original Cord to make it longer so that we have more control of the prisoner. Here we have one hand tied to the back. We're putting the bundle underneath the opposite elbow and around and underneath itself. And now we'll bring the rope up across the back to the opposite armpit. We go under the armpit, around the upper arm, up under itself, and snug it up. Now we go up across the neck on the opposite side, around the neck, back down the back to the opposite armpit. The bundle is now pushed underneath the armpit back to front. around the upper arm, back under the rope coming from the neck, snug it up again, cross the back 
down to the opposite elbow, around the elbow, and put the cord underneath itself, and again, snug itself up. The cord is then brought back down between the elbow and the body, around to the front. The other arm is then brought to the front and tied to the standard loop and half hitch. The cord is then brought across the body, front to back, on the opponent's left side, that is, the screen right. After you bring the cord through under the arm, make your inline loop, pass it underneath the tie, going from the elbow to the wrist, make your standard overhand loop, and tie it off. Make your chain as usual and you're finished. Instead of untying it as usual we take the wagasashi and just cut it off.